Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, here we are once more in Dr. Watson's study. And maybe we're not glad to get here. If we hadn't had a Sherlock Holmes story waiting for us at the other end, we'd have never ventured out on a night like this. Uh, pretty bad weather out, eh, eh, Mr. Bell? Indeed it is, Dr. Watson. There's a cold wind that chills you to the bone. I had one hand holding my coat collar and the other holding my hat all the way over. I felt as though some malignant deity were determined to keep me from reaching your door. You hear that wind? Hmm. Reminds me of what I just escaped from. Oh, it's typical Edinburgh weather, Mr. Bell. Perhaps you've heard that there's no language richer in terms of reproach against the howling wind than the Scots, darling. Snell, bligh, nearly, scouthering, to mention just a handful. All of them words that carry a shiver with them. Yes, as Stevenson so aptly puts it, Edinburgh pays cruelly for our high seat and commanding views in one of the vilest climates under heaven. She's liable to be beaten upon by all the winds that blow. To be drenched with rain, to be buried in cold sea fogs out of the east, and powdered with the snow as it comes flying southward from the highland hills. The weather is raw and boisterous in winter, shifty and ungenial in summer, and a downright purgatory in the spring. It sounds like a pretty unattractive place, Dr. Watson. Well, there you're entirely wrong, Mr. Bell. Nowhere will you find such stark magnificence, such grim beauty. Edinburgh, the great granite sphinx of the north, Crouching high on a towering rock, looking across the intervening plains to the waters of the Forth and to the North Sea. Fascinating, regal, splendid, and cruel. Yes, I think this is just the night to tell the story of the haunted bagpipes. One of the weirdest and most gruesome adventures that Holmes and I ever shared. The setting was Edinburgh. And the motivating character, Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty, the man Holmes called the Napoleon of Crime. Exactly. I wondered when we were going to have another of your famous bouts with Professor Moriarty. They're always pretty hair-raising. Yes, and I think I can safely promise you that this is the most hair-raising of the lot. In fact, it's so unbelievably macabre and gruesome that I've never told it to any but to my closest friends, those who know that I'm a truthful man. In fact, sometimes, in the same light of day, I doubt myself that this adventure really happened. But a night like this brings it all back to me in all its horror. Yes, Mr. Bell, on a night like this we realize that anything is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, before Dr. Watson begins his story... Men, I have a friend who used to comb his hair with water. After the water dried, his hair would get out of place and he didn't look neatly groomed. Well, I ran into him last Saturday and he said he'd heard me talking about Kreml hair tonic and decided to try it. He should see the big improvement Kreml made in his appearance. Why, he looked like a different man. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps every hair in place all day, just as you combed it in the morning. Kreml gives hair a healthy-looking luster, too. Yet it never leaves hair feeling greasy or dirty like some of those sticky preparations you want to wash right out. Kreml always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. It always gives hair such a clean-cut, prosperous appearance. Why not try it? Spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, won't you please go on with the story? The shivers run up and down my spine in anticipation. Well, I certainly will. As I look back on that particular visit to Edinburgh, it seems that a cold fear settled into the very marrow of my bones from the moment we got off the train late one winter afternoon and caught our first glimpse of Edinburgh Castle rising bleak and menacing out of a cloud of fog and rain. There it is, Watson, in all its austere majesty, Edinburgh Castle. (laughs) Nice, impressive pile of stone. Nice and grim. No grimmer than its history, Watson. Part castle, part fortress, part prison. Wars have been plotted there. Dancing has lasted deep into the night. Murder has been done in its chamber. Oh, well, this is no time to stand here chatting. Let's get out in the, uh, this confounded rain. Rain, Watson? You are getting soft. This isn't rain, it's just a good scotch mist. Mist, my, my grandmother. I, oh. I'm soaked to the skin and my, my teeth are chattering like castanets. Thank heaven the town has a, 
has a few modern hotels, a nice hot toddy at the Royal, eh? I'm sorry to disappoint you, Watson, but this is not a pleasure trip. We must uh, forego the luxuries of Princess Street and take up our quarters in the old town. The old town? Holmes, you mean that we're going to live in one of those crumbling grey stone houses all huddled together on the slope leading up to the castle? Exactly. Why, they're nothing but tenements. But those lands, as they're called, once housed the flower of the Scottish nobility. In the old days, this was a walled city, and space was at a premium. That is why those crazy buildings tower eight and ten stories into the yes, air. Yes, the days of the nobility are over. Those tenements are full of goodness knows what. True. What more suitable dwelling place could one imagine for our friend, Professor Moriarty? Professor Moriarty? Quite. You may have noticed, Watson, that London has been singularly free from crime during the last few months. And for a very good reason. Professor Moriarty was not in residence. Oh, you mean that you think we've succeeded in driving him out? No, Watson. Let us not underrate the professor. He is not in London because he has business elsewhere. But where? I confess I was in complete ignorance until the day before yesterday morning when I received a telegram informing me that one of Moriarty's chief assistants had been seen prowling through the graves at Greyfriars. Then I remembered that Professor Moriarty has a particular reason for hating Edinburgh. He's not a man to forget his grudges, Watson. The question is, shall we be in time to prevent his revenge? But here, get into this cab before you catch pneumonia. Professor Moriarty in Edinburgh. Huh. I thought the place looked even more forbidding than usual. Oh, cabby, let us out in front of St. Giles. Ah, hi. <laughs> Holmes, why St. Giles? You're not going in for sightseeing this time of day? No, Watson. We must go from there on by foot, I'm afraid. By foot in this weather? The gutters are fairly running with muddy water. Oh, no one asked you to walk in the gutters, Watson. Here you be. St. Giles. And so it is. Come along, Watson. Oh, gracious me, in this rain. I say, Cabby, where's Hangman's Lane from here? Lush, you'll no be going there. Why not? It's where we hope to spend the night. Tis an unchancy spot, gentlemen. You'll no find me going up Hangman's Lane after dark. As bad as that, huh? I'll no stand here arguing with you. It's the first land back of the kirk, if you must go. Thanks. Here, drink to our help. A horn. There you stand, two fine upstanding gentlemen, hale and hearty, with a black shadow of death looking over your shoulder. Oh, huh? huh? ah, well... Then I say I didn't warn you. Come along, Beatrice. Hmm, cheerful individual. Holmes, what do you say? Let's go back and spend the night at a good hotel. We can't possibly find any lodgings in a place like Hangman's Lane. But we shall, Watson. We shall. They're expecting us. Come along. What do you mean, they're expecting us? I mean the owner of most of the tenements in Hangman's Lane has arranged that we should be taken care of. He is uh, most anxious to have us inspect his property. Oh, very well, but I don't see what that has to do with our search for Professor Moriarty. Whenever anything curious and inexplicable happens in the professor's neighborhood, the chances are he's mixed up in it. Ah, here's Hangman's Lane. Narrow, steep little byway, eh, Watson? I don't like it, Holmes. No lights in any of the windows. Usually these tall houses are overrun with inhabitants. Several flam families to, to a floor. Look, look, the buildings in this street look positively deserted. They are deserted, Watson. That's the most interesting part of it. Oh, really? One particular house hasn't been open for several hundred years. But during the last month, the rest of the tenements have been vacated too. Their inhabitants have fled from them like rats from a sinking ship. The rents have been lowered to the vanishing point and still there are no takers. The people hereabouts seem to think the whole street is haunted. Haunted? Uh, uh, couldn't, couldn't we come up here and look the place over in the daytime, Holmes? Look, already the, the light's beginning to fade. Unfortunately, Watson, the phenomena we're going to investigate occur only at night. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Ah, here's the house we're stay in. There should be a bell somewhere. Yes. Well, perhaps there isn't anyone to let us in. I think there will be, Watson. Yes, I hear footsteps. Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, the Lord be thanked. One moment, gentlemen, I'll unbar the door. Oh, be 
Please to enter. Go ahead, Watson. Good Lord, it's dark in here. And if you'll kindly step this way, there's a bra blazer burning and candles lit in the back parlor. Oh, oh, the funny gentleman. This corridor is not so smooth as once it was. Yeah, so I discovered. Yeah, this is the place. Please enter. Oh, well, this is more like it, eh, Holmes? What a magnificent old room. Just look at that fireplace. Aye. For once a blight bit this old house. Full of lords and their ladies, they say. But here, gentlemen, will you be standing in front of the fire and dry your, your bricks? Not a bad idea. We're pretty wet, eh, hey, Watson? <clears throat> wet? There's a brandy on the shell of your what now we drop it. A tasty cockily pie in the pot. And no, you'll forgive me. I'm on shank my cellar where. I'm going so soon. But uh, we've just arrived. Oh, Mr. Holmes. I dare not stay after sundown. I'm late to let you alone, but I dare not stay. But in a fashion cell, I'll return the morn early. But what is there to be afraid of? The neighbors. Neighbors? Aye, the neighbors and the old hurly host other side of this wall. But no one has lived in that house next door for years. Not humans, no. No living man has crossed the door stain this hundred year. But there be others. Bogles. You can hear the rattle of their going and coming every night through the war. Have you ever heard these ghosts, or bogles, as you call them? No, I certainly have not. I will not stay at her sundown. But the bogles, there's no the worst of it. Really? Aye. Be times you can hear the sound of doodling. Sound of bagpipes, eh? Aye. And that's when they be entertaining old horny yourself. The devil himself? Aye. Hmm. The ghosts next door move in very high society, eh, Watson? Mm. Uh, uh, what was that? Just the wind in the chimney. I would have swore with the devil's turtle sucker. No, I don't think so. I'll not be waiting to find out. When the skirling begins, they say the hoose it sell dirge like it was singing a dirge. Good night, gentlemen, and God help you. Oh, say. She was frightened, all right. I wish that chimney would stop moaning. But those two legends... The house next door and the haunted bagpipes. They're famous Edinburgh superstitions. I'd like to hear more about them. Well, I've heard more than I want to already. Confound that chimney. That building next door is one of the so-called fatal houses. Fatal houses? Houses marked generations ago by the Great Plague. Discipline in the time of pestilence was sharp and sudden. The houses having the disease were marked by a large cross. No one dared enter or leave. Furniture was destroyed and houses sealed up. In those houses, of which one or two still remain, the plague is supposed to lie ambushed like a basilisk, ready to escape and spread sickness and death through the city once the doors are open. Oh, but that's ridiculous, Holmes, ridiculous. Germs can't sustain themselves like that. Oh, at least we've no medical evidence that they can. Oh, should we gone to an hotel? The other legend is not quite so gruesome. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. It's about a secret passage that is supposed to have existed in the time of Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, between Edinburgh Castle and Holyrood Palace, which uh, lies at the other end of town. About a century and a half ago, a piper made a bet that he could walk the length of it. He started at the castle, piping merrily. The crowds were able to follow him through the streets above by the sound of the skirling. Everything was going smoothly. They followed the sound down from the castle along the top of the hill... Just about here, the piping stopped suddenly in the middle of a note. And that was the last that was ever heard of the piper. Noxious gas, most probably. Uh, some say the devil was so captivated by his playing that he carried him off to hell. Well, what of it? As long as he stays there and doesn't go about waking up the neighbors? Uh, but that's just what he has been doing for the last month or so. Oh, nonsense. It's just a, a noisy chimney like this one. Why should a ghost who's kept quiet for over a hundred years suddenly decide to return and annoy people. That, my dear Watson, is what I'm anxious to find out. Holmes. Holmes. Do you hear that? By Jove. Then it's more than just a superstition. Holmes, it's a, it's a piper. The devil's bagpiper. He's playing in the house next door. Splendid. Well, what are we going to do? Want me to inform the authorities? And have them put the devil in jail? No, Watson, I have a better plan. I suggest we go over and call on the old gentleman himself.
just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers in the mysterious house next door. Men, if you're wise, you'll start right away and take better care of the hair you've got. Remember, handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. So why be content with just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Kreml hair tonic? This highly specialized hair tonic goes in for modern, natural-looking hair grooming. It keeps hair perfectly groomed all day long, looking so neat and attractive yet never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And at the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and leaves the scalp feeling so alive and tingling. And if your hair breaks off and falls when you comb it because it's so dry, use Kreml, which actually helps condition hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer and more pliable. And since Kreml is never sticky or gummy and because it's such a nice, clean product, you can use it every day and your hair will always look its very best. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the ghostly bagpiper? Did Holmes no, ever... No, no, really... no, not so fast, Mr. Bell. Holmes insisted that we investigate the house next door at once. And I must admit that it was with some misgivings... I followed him into the street. Come along, Watson. Oh, another little bit of local superstition I forgot to mention. They say that the corpses of people who died here of the plague sometimes come to life and wander about the house. Holmes, I wish you wouldn't talk like that. Oh, this, this sleet cutting into my face like a knife. Oh, here's the doorway. Now find out if the key still works. Yes, it looks more like a crowbar than a key. I only hope the lock isn't too rusty. Hmm. Won't budge. Thank heaven. Let's go back. Oh, give me that oil can. Perhaps a few drops of oil. There you are. Ah, confound this lock. No good trying to break the door in. It's as solid as Gibraltar. A good deal more solid than the house itself, judging by that long crack over the archway up there. Hmm, yes, that is a crack. The building is settling, Watson. That crack... Hello, I've turned the key. Lock's decided to work. Ah, the door sticks now. Hinges rusty. Come on, Watson, get your back into it. Uh, it's, it's moving, Holmes. Yes, so is that crack. Hurry, help me close the door before the archway falls on us. Huh. Isn't it quiet? Can't even hear the wind. It smells like a tomb. Yes, but there's something else. Something unhealthy. Like a disease I smelt once in the tropics. Well, you don't think it's true that the plague is still... Uh... Nonsense. You yourself said it wasn't possible. Better light that dark lantern we brought along. Yes, indeed. I hate pumping about in the dark. Ah. I can't say that it's much more cheerful in the light. Look at those great dirty cobwebs. That old tapestry hanging in shreds. Yes, nothing has been moved since the plague first touched the house. Look there in that room. That old oak table set for a meal. One of the goblets overturned. It gives me the creeps up and down my spine. Nothing else of interest here. Let's get on to the next room. How hollow uh, our footsteps sound. Yes. This must have been the living room of the house. Ashes of a bygone fire still on the hearth. Holmes. Holmes. Look. There's some people seated in those chairs over there. Nonsense. Give me the lantern. By Jove, I think you're right. That smells stronger in here. We'll soon find out. Watson, hold the lantern. Holmes. It's a body. A naked body. A corpse, Watson. A cadaver. Holmes, don't touch it. For the love of heaven, don't touch it. Why, Watson? Can't you see? The swollen eyes, the, the froth of the mouth, the flesh turned black. I've never seen it before, but those are the symptoms, Holmes. That's the black plague. What? That's not possible. That's crazy. Here, look. Let me look at the other chairs. Yes. Here an old man and here a woman. All victims of the black death. Holmes. These are the bodies of people who died in this house centuries ago of the plague. But they're not decayed. It's not possible. We must be going mad. Tell me quick, Watson. Did women do their hair with fringes at the time of the last plague? Fringes? Now I know that we're crazy. Quiet, Watson. Do you hear that? It's the devil coming with his piper. He's going to make him dance. The old woman was right. The house does vibrate to the sound of those pipes. He's coming, Holmes. He's coming. He's coming. 
Good evening, gentlemen. Dear me, if it isn't our friend Professor Moriarty. I uh, had no idea you were a musician. You admire my piping, eh? Yes, I wondered how long it would take you to find me. Allow me to congratulate you, Mr. Holmes. You're very prompt. Most flattering, Professor. But I assure you it was simplicity itself. You didn't think I'd overlook anything as obvious as a sealed house and the haunted bagpiper who so conveniently came back to life in the past month? Yes, I might have known my little roost to get rid of my superstitious neighbors wouldn't keep Sherlock Holmes away. Perhaps it's just as well. You've been getting in my way quite a bit lately, Mr. Holmes. I shall have to continue my experiments begun on these three poor devils. On yourself and Dr. Watson. You mean the plague? You're going to give us the black plague? I really must try my serum on two healthy specimens before I pronounce it perfect. After all, these three, an old beggar, a thief dying of starvation, and a woman of ill repute, they could hardly be expected to resist the disease. That's very interesting. I was just assuring Dr. Watson that these uh, corpses were quite recent because I was sure that women didn't wear fringes during the last pestilence. Mm. And Dr. Watson was afraid they might be victims of the original plague. <laughs> but in a sense, he's right. The uh, <clears throat> victims are recent. But they were killed by the germs of the original Black Death. <laughs> uh, most amusing, isn't it? Fascinating. Tell me, how did you discover those germs? They were in this house. I found a nice little culture of them in a glass of calf's foot jelly, which was on the table in the front room. How they ever survived as long as this, I can't imagine. Uh, but here, gentlemen, come into my laboratory. I want to show you what I've done with them. Oh, what should we do? Black plague. It's a terrible thing. The man's mad. Humor him, Watson. Humor him. Oh, yes, shall I? Here we are, gentlemen. Quite a nice, modern little outlay for such an ancient house. And... Yes, it is an ancient house, Professor. But here, uh, this little test tube. It contains enough of the Black Plague to wipe out the entire city of Edinburgh. Yes, I rather thought that was your purpose. You've never forgotten how they drove you out at the time of the Burke and Hare scandal. You know about that? Quite. Your name wasn't Moriarty then, huh? What of it? You were Dr. Knox's young assistant at the time. Together, you were carrying on some exciting experiments. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Experiments that might have saved the world a great deal of suffering. But you were short of cadavers. It wasn't you, by any chance, who suggested to Burke and Hare, those two body snatchers, that a body did not have to be legally dead to be acceptable. Well, what if I did? They only killed the refuse of the city. Beggars, scum. Quite. But they met the hangman nonetheless. Aye, the fools. What price the death of a few when we might have discovered a cure that would have saved all humanity. Humanity. Bah, I hate it. Ever since then, I'd sworn I'd get revenge on humanity. And the law-abiding citizens of Edinburgh in particular. And now, the time has come. Tomorrow, the contents of this test tube will spread destruction throughout the city. But in the meantime, you, Mr. Holmes, and you, Dr. Watson, you know too much. You shall be the first of the law-abiding citizens to feel the prick of my little needle. Just a moment till I prepare my instrument. Stop him, Holmes! Stop him! Do not move, gentlemen. One drop out of this test tube, even in its present state, is enough to cause death. I quite agree. By the way, Professor Moriarty, while you are preparing your solution, you uh, have no objections if I play a tune on your bagpipes? I used to be rather good at them in my younger days. Not at all. If it'll amuse you. Right. Watson, stand here beside me against this wall. No, no, quite Don't argue. Uh... Holmes, the house, it's vibrating. I can feel the wall quiver. That's the note that does it. Hold on there. You're shaking the house. The foundation. I can hear them cracking. Look out, man. You'll bring the house down. Well, that's what we intend to do. The walls. I've got to get out of here. We can't see. The front door's blocked. The secret passage in the basement. If I can reach it in time. Holmes, he's dropped the test tube. It's spreading across the floor. Watson, step back into the fireplace. Hurry. Mr. 
Bell Holmes played that note on the bagpipes until the house crashed in upon itself. But, Dr. Watson, weren't you killed? <laughs> Not quite, Mr. Bell. No, no. Holmes had deduced from that crack above the front door that the house was weak. And he also guessed which way it would fall if it did cave in. The wall that we were standing against in the fireplace alone were left standing. If you've seen any ruined castles, Mr. Bell, you'll notice how frequently that seems to happen. And Professor Moriarty, did he escape? Unfortunately, he did, Mr. Bell, through the secret passage in the basement which he had mentioned. But the Black Plague and those corpses, what did you do about that? We left them where they were. No use informing the authorities, they wouldn't have believed us. And besides, it would have been too dangerous to go poking about in the ruins. No home simply poured the spirits from our lantern on the old rafters and started a fire. The wood was as dry as tinder, and there was quite a blaze. And fire, Mr. Bell, is a great purifier. And so you prevented an outbreak of the Black Death. Hmm. That's a gruesome story. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Watson will return in just a moment to tell us something about the thrilling Sherlock Holmes mystery he has for us next Monday night. Ladies, those beautiful powers models whose photographs you see in magazines always have to keep their hair shining bright with dazzling highlights. Now, here's how they do it. Powers models were among the very first to discover how cremel shampoo brings out all the natural sparkling luster of each tiny strand of hair. How it keeps hair simply radiant for days. Yes, and those lovely Powers models told me that no other shampoo gives their hair more natural, glossy luster. It never dries the hair or makes it brittle. Well, that's because cremel shampoo has such a beneficial oil base. It actually helps hair, and it keeps the hair from becoming dry. Then, ladies, why not take a tip from Beauty Wise Powers Models? See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing beauty. Buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. I wonder. Next week. Next week... I think I'll tell you the story of an experience that Sherlock Holmes and I had was something I was convinced was an invention of the devil. I call it the invention of the adventure, rather, of the horseless carriage. Horseless carriage? You mean one of the early automobiles? One of the very earliest, Mr. Bell. Holmes was called in to protect the inventor and, in the end, had to solve the mystery of his murder. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the horseless carriage. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.